All right. Um, good afternoon to you all. Um, my name is Emmanuel Mensa, and I'm going to be the moderator. Um, let me call myself the captain of the ship today. And I am joining you from Kampala, Uganda in East Africa. Um, just for us to recognize the different diversity, I would request that you type in the chat um, where you are connecting us from. Um, you could as well add your name and the organization that you belong to. And that is going to form the basis of uh, the diversity that we are going to talk about today. Um, I'll be looking through the chat um, as time goes on. Um, all right, so I'm seeing a couple of uh, diversity, um, Uganda, Turkey, uh, this is great. I mean, uh, it's, it's a good start. Um, so today's webinar, I would just want to start by saying that um, include it as an organization that's recognized the value of diversity. And um, as you can see, like I mentioned, this is what has drawn all of us here today, different people from different places, different abilities. And um, you, you can also see when I introduce my panelists that uh, the diversity is reflected. And that is one of the core value of include of it. Um, now to today's topic, when we think of diversity, equity and inclusion, which uh, hereafter I'm going to call it DEI, we might think of DEI in the workplace first and how this impact a company organization's innovation as well as the well-being, performance and profit. There is another side though to DEI in service provision, social assistance and protection activities, such as development and humanitarian action, or what is often called, uh, what we call DEI in operations. The measurement of success or impact is not the bottom line, and which is going to form uh, what we are going to discuss today, but it is specific with the outcomes for communities and the diverse groups of people that make up communities. Um, in our agenda today, um, we are going to have some time, like an hour to cover a very big issue, which my panelists will, will make it much simpler to help us to learn and learn and be able to ensure DEI. Um, is achieved wherever we find ourselves. We would equally love to hear from you about your experiences of DEI training and implementation in your organizations. Um, with a focus on this, we have built some pools where as the discussion and the learning goes on, we are going to allow you to share those experiences. Um, it is important for me to mention that as much as Inkudovate has carried out a couple of a webinar. This is the first in a series on DEI uh, that we are going to be hosting. And so we do recommend and request you to revisit our website and social media platforms to learn more details and get ready to engage with us. Um, let me quickly mention that we are the best in giving you the right support and services that you need when it comes to DEI. Um, I have a very diverse panelist uh, with a lot of experiences seasoned in their own way. And one of them um, is Florence Indagiri. And she is the first female lawyer with a visual impairment in Uganda. She holds a Bachelor of Law from Akere University, um, as well as also one from uh, University of Leeds in the UK. Okay, she's currently pursuing her PhD and looking at access to maternal, sexual and reproductive health services for persons with disabilities. Um, some of the impressive thing I can mention about Florence 
is that she is currently the chair of UN Women's Regional uh, Civil Society Advisory Group and also a program officer on disability at Makiriri School of Law. Uh, so get some emojis and welcome Florence in that degree. Uh, next is Chauvin Foran. Um, it's interesting. She has had two careers. And the first one is uh, she was a chartered surveyor, as well as also a program coordinator and gender diversity inclusion specialist, but in the focus area of today, that is humanitarian and development sector. Um, she holds a master's degree in equality studies from University College Dublin and has equally worked across Africa, the Middle East, um, even in uh, Geneva. And so she is the right person to help us dissect and uh, be able to understand the aspect of um, DEI in humanitarian and development areas. So another imaging for her, as I jump on my last panelist, Wendy O, who started her path as a medical doctor and she had to switch to diversity and inclusion after she has served three years as a commissioner of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of South Africa. And after serving in that position, um, she then became the director of transformation and employment equity at the University of West, uh, West Rand. And then she has been a consultant for diversity, equity, and inclusion um, at a Resolve Workplace. Um, she has equally published well um, in general articles and has a book chapter where she shares her experience working on the Reconciliation um, Commission. And so we, we are going to get into the key questions that will guide our discussion and learnings. Um, I want to start with um, Sovan. Um, from your experience, why is DEI the hot topic in the development and humanitarian sectors right now? And I would equally want you to share on, is there a danger that it is replaced by the next hot topic anytime soon. Oh. Just a trouble on muting. Thanks a million for the introduction, um, Manuel, and thank you for the question. Um, DEI is most certainly, I think we'll all agree, a hot topic in the sector at the moment. Um, but let me develop the idea, and I wanted to use the that analogy of, of heat. Um, I've worked in the humanitarian and development sectors for over 20 years now, and I've seen um, significant change in the way, way that D DEI has been um, considered and addressed during this time. It's simmered away gently, and it has also boiled over um, with certain events that captured everyone's attention and I think um, catalyzed action. So in my experience and opinion, when it's been simmering, um, attention has been for the most part on mainstreaming gender in programming and operations. A lot of investment was put into mainstreaming gender in particular and targeted actions on gender in human, uh, humanitarian and development programming. But then there was a significant shift in around 2010, 2011, when humanitarian and development actors representing age and disability, for instance, became very active in the same space. And together with organizations and actors representing other diversity factors, such as LGBT, IQ plus and race, started to explore and to collaborate around new um, intersectional frameworks, including what has been called um, people-centered approaches, um, accountability to affected populations, um, community engagement and accountability, and other iterations. But then just thinking about the boiling or tipping points, um, when the development sector started to reflect 
the events and the discussions in the wider society, such as the events in, and I'm only going back a, a few years on, on this, um, I think there's a much longer history we could look at, but the events in 2017 that sparked the Me Too campaign, equally in the development and humanitarian sector, suddenly there was this enormous tension on sexual exploitation and abuse in those sectors, despite the events in West Africa in 2002. And that then culminated in the hashtag A2 campaign. And then there was the horrific killing of George Floyd in the US in May 2020, which again, appeared to be a catalytic moment when our um, attention to an issue that had long been acknowledged in the development and humanitarian sectors. And for the humanitarian sector in particular, there was the World Humanitarian Summit in 2016, which highlighted the localization agenda. So right now, societies, governments, donor governments, um, activists, and in their turn, the development and humanitarian sectors are talking about decolonialization of aid, LGBTIQ um, rights and needs in their programs and activities. And then just to the final question in, in there, is there a danger that this hot topic will be replaced by the next hot topic? I don't think so. I think that the topic is now too big um, too influential on both the sectors and broader societies. But just as it's done over the past few years, I expect the topic to continue to evolve. Um, and, and these aren't easy topics. They're, they're complex, they're political, as is the language and the ideas around them. Um, the vested interests are huge. And right now, in my opinion, the development and humanitarian sectors don't have all the tools and capacities, capacities they need to address these effectively. So to make sure that the topic remains hot and at the forefront of the sector's action, I think it's important that we continue to develop our capacities to understand how the multiple facets of the topic are emerging and to understand the perspectives of the many stakeholders to them to, and to, to um, address the issues and support leaders, representative bodies and communities to engage on them. Thanks. I'll hand back to you, Emmanuel. All right. Thank you. And now I move to Wendy. Um, Chauvin has shared the timeline, the value of a DEI. Um, what, what do you have to add uh, based on your experience and the mm -hmm. aspect of uh, being a hot topic in the development sector? Look, I think, I think Siobhan has given such a comprehensive um, answer. I don't have a lot to add. I mean, other than to say, you know, I absolutely agree that it, the DEI conversation is constantly involve, evolving. My experience is largely in, in the corporate world and the shifts that there have been over the last 20 years in the way we talk about DEI um, are really significant. And, and perhaps I'd like to add that we don't stop at DEI now, we now talk about DEIB, and the B is about belonging, which wasn't part of the conversation, you know, a few years ago. Um, so I think it will not become a lukewarm or a cold topic. I think it's going to be hot, not only because it's really important that these issues are addressed, but I think there are increasing expectations from society, from funders, from boards of uh, you know, humanitarian and development agencies that these issues really become a priority um, in, in, in organizations. And that's a, a priority both in terms of the externally focused work um, that, that these agencies do, but also internally. You know, it's important that um, your own people, your own employees, your own affiliates feel that sense of um, belonging and inclusion. It's as important for them as it is to the people who, um, who you are working with and serving. All right, thank you very much. Um, participants and listeners, I'm sure you are picking um, a couple of nuggets and great insights and learnings as well. Um, I'm just, I just want to remind you that but, uh, Florence is joining and um, she will equally share um, from the perspective of a person with disability and so we look forward to having her and then we can hear from her as well and um, now to my next question 
Um, this time I want to start with Wendy. Um, what in your opinion are the barriers that limit the ability of development and humanitarian organizations to be inclusive of diversity in the workforce as well as their operations? Over Emmanuel, to you, if I may toss this over the fence and ask Siobhan to start and then um, I will follow. All right then, over Siobhan. Happy to do so, Wendy. Um, and, and such a pity we, we haven't, uh, Florence is encountering some technical issues because our conversations pre in preparation were just so, so rich. I'm, I'm looking forward to her inputs. Um, so in answer to this question, um, I, I, I was thinking about it and I was thinking that I'm sure many on the call today will be familiar with the adage um, that diversity is the fact, inclusion is the act. And I always interpret this to mean that diversity describes the composition of an organization, a company or a community, while inclusion is the action or actions that will um, mobilize or activate diversity. Um, but in further iterations of the same saying, um, inclusion went from being an act to being a choice and a practice. So, so taking that idea, in, in my experience, many development and humanitarian organizations are putting in the work to diversify their workforce and to acknowledge and understand the diversity in the communities with whom they work, which, which are positive um, steps. However, I, I have the sense that the work stops or at least slows down there, whereas in fact, this is the very point where the work of inclusion needs to start. And so in this way, a significant barrier to DEI in development and humanitarian HR and operations is the choices made or not made to develop an ongoing practice of inclusion. I think it's already been alluded to in, in, in the conversation so far. Um, DEI is, is clearly not a one and done. It's not one thing. It's not one action. In fact, you know, as I said, the DEI space in development and humanitarian action has gotten even more crowded, complex and political. So DEI needs to be a commitment to the whole journey of continual engagement, learning, adapting, capacity strengthening and investment. And then another thing. In the corporate sector, there's be, there, there, there have been a lot of studies on the business case for DEI, and these show quite clearly that DEI is good for business and at the same time delivers equity, productivity, innovation. But the same business case doesn't work for the nonprofit development and humanitarian sectors. And anyway, the evidence on the better outcomes for marginalized groups served by development and humanitarian program isn't available or it isn't available at the scale to make that business case. So it's proving really difficult to shift the power in complex development and humanitarian structures and systems when you rely on arguments for social justice, fairness and equality, which themselves demand the dismantling of pretty hardy systems of sexism, racism, colonialism, and all the other isms, never mind the reliance on so far largely unmeasured impact outcomes. So DEI issues are often difficult and sensitive, but, and I'm going to stick with the heat analogy, um, what it boils down to for me is this, the more diverse development and humanitarian organizations are, and the more inclusive and safer workplaces are, the easier, or at least maybe less difficult, it will be for us to discuss, challenge, and address issues of equity, fairness, and dignity. Thanks. All right, thank you. This is wonderful. I mean, the point you made about, um action to a choice um, in terms of whether you choose to act or not, but also recognizing the complex environment and the structures um, within the humanitarian sector really makes it clear. And also, um, I mean, gives a point to reason about how best we should look at tackling some of these uh, barriers. And Wendy, I want to keep you on hold um, okay. because I need to listen to Florence. 
Um, so let, let me go to Florence. Um, Florence, welcome. And um, I would want to get your opinion um, on the barriers that limit the availability of development and humanitarian organizations uh, to be inclusive of diversity um, in the workforce and operations. And um, um, kindly do put emphasis on the aspect um, of persons with disabilities. Over to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, moderator. And thank you everybody for joining in. Uh, I'm speaking in the perspective of, of disability. And for me, instead of calling it DEI, I call it DDEI, Disability, Diversity, Equality, and Inclusion. I'm a person with disability with lived experience of over 37 years because I was born a disabled person, coupled with a skilled experience of 15 years as a lawyer and as a, 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 a doctoral candidate who has worked in the area of disability inclusion for a long time. So first, what I want to say is that diversity is the difference that uh, humanity brings to everybody and making workplaces more inclusive, equal and accessible is a moral imperative. And the many barriers that are faced by development organizations and humanitarian sector are, first of all, the, the lack of awareness of how to promote inclusion equality and diversity. This is because uh, there have been many constructions based on traditional myths that regard some people as unable to do things or to perform, especially people with disabilities that regard them as people in need of charity or medical treatment. Yet, uh, the gone are the days with the ratification of the convention, uh, attitudes need to be changed, they need to deconstruct those myths to bring on board people with disabilities uh, for the betterment of society. The other barrier is the lack of a system approach on inclusion. When workplaces don't have inclusive policies, when development organizations don't have an inclusive agenda that promotes equality for all, then many targets are bound to, be, are bound to fail. I will still continue to say that with the commitments in the Sustainable Development Goals, where several countries have ratified and volunteered to uh, implement the commitments, then inclusion uh, will come to stay. So this calls for the removal of such barriers. And now, when it comes to the recruitment processes, still the human resource uh, perspective, do not understand uh, inclusive ways of advertisement where information is provided in accessible formats for applicants, uh, receiving applicants with different uh, diversities, uh, ensuring that they are given reasonable accommodation, especially those who need sign language, the people who are visually impaired who need braille or audio or tactile who are deaf, blind, and others who need information in easy to read symbols and plain language, especially those with psychosocial and intellectual disability. And then the mindset. When the first time I attended an interview at Oxfam, at first they didn't know that I was visually impaired because I never told them, but I was pretty a qualified lawyer. And when I appeared and I responded to all their questions, they were wondering whether it, could, it was possible for me to work in Karamoja. So the way the prejudice that people put on us, the, the fact that we have to prove ourselves 10 times more than the able-bodied, that we can do some work is really a big barrier to the workplace, to the development organizations and to humanitarian sectors. Uh, as if that is not bad enough, the working environment itself sometimes is not accessible. The staff are not sensitized about people with disabilities and there is general lack of participation, meaningful participation in the design of policies, programs and implementation mechanisms, including budgets. Whenever the voices of people with disabilities are lacking, many efforts are bound to fail because their needs will not be taken into account. It's very important to realize that a barrier-free society is a better society for all of us. So the removal of barriers uh, uh, is very key towards promoting 
uh, diversity, equality, and inclusion. And sometimes it's very important to take into account positive measures in the name of affirmative action or train track approach that brings on board specific measures alongside mainstreaming of diversity, equality, and disability. Thank you. Thank you, Florence. That's, that's wonderful. I mean, from a brilliant lawyer. And I think the key point is a reflection of the motto that nothing about us without us. Um, with nice aspect of accessibility, reasonable accommodation, um, also being mindful of um, using a systems approach. Um, but importantly is that we all need to be aware and be able to put in place the right measures to ensure um, that we are uh, including and making sure everyone um, does benefit. Um, these, these are really wonderful nuggets. And I mean, you can never get this from any other place apart from here on Includovate webinar. So do well to keep your fingers crossed, but also get to our website and um, be able to connect with us anytime. Um, I'm going to interact with you, um, the audience, but then I would want to go to my next question before I set in the pool. Um, this time around, um, I want to ask a question and then I will, I will get to start with Florence again. Um, what successful initiatives or best practices have you seen organizations implement concerning diversity and inclusion issues? Over to you, Florence. Okay, thank you very much, uh, moderator. Uh, I will mention a few key points. Uh, one of the best practices I've seen organizations implement is first of all, center, centering persons with disabilities uh, <laughs> Uh, right from the level of the design process. This means that they are, they are consulted uh, to bring on board their issues and to ass assess the entire system to, uh, to analyze whether it is inclusive. So centering them doesn't mean just uh, that they, they will just be consulted, but sometimes they are Part, the, there is a component of representation. So being part of the senior management that articulates issues, that passes uh, decisions and policies is very critical to ensure that uh, the practice of equality, diversity and inclusion is put in place. Uh, so that is really, really very key. Um, ensuring comprehensive accessibility in the organization or workplace or humanitarian sector of both information, communication, uh, the environment and the hearts of the entire staff is very, very critical because even in the absence of funding, if people are very creative, they'll get the meeting from the higher floor and bring it to the ground floor for a person with physical disability to attend. Yeah, so that's also very important. And then putting in place all the necessary modifications and adjustments required in the organization to ensure that the entire system provides a mode of inclusion and equality is an important practice. How this has been addressed is that uh, many uh, there have been many capacity building trainings conducted on how to provide reasonable accommodation to uh, a number of human resource persons and uh, practitioners in both development organizations and the humanitarian sector. <laughs> uh, good practices don't only stop at that, but they also uh, allude to the provision of uh, opportunities, especially for people who don't find jobs easily by providing internships and volunteerships uh, to share experiences and best practices as role models uh, in order to bring about inclusion. The establishment of inclusive policies at the workplace in humanitarian development organizations and the donor world is also very critical to bring about the principle of nothing for us without us, leave no one behind, 
equality and inclusion. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, let me go to Wendy. Uh, Wendy, um, what, what can you add? I, I think for me, it's absolutely critical to start with leadership. If you don't have leadership commitment and buy in, you know, you can try as much as you, you can at more lower levels of management. Um, and, and your efforts will simply not be sustainable. I think far too often um, DEI is sort of delegated to the HR department or people and culture or whatever that department is called. You know, it's the HR consultant's job or potentially the, D, the DEI manager's job to make this work, and it isn't. It's the, it's the job of leadership and leadership must be held accountable by including DEI deliverables in their performance agreements. Um, secondly, I think often we respond to a gut feel about what might not be working in terms of DEI. So we think that women are underrepresented in senior management because they are leaving the organization. Um, whereas perhaps it's because our recruitment processes are actually mitigating against the appointment of women. So it's really important to understand the challenges that we are dealing with. Take data-driven decisions, not gut or anecdotal driven decisions, and use the data. And it's not only quantitative data. Speak to your employees, you know, as Florence said. Find out how they are feeling. Do spot surveys. Hold focus groups in order to really understand what it is that you need to be doing. Um, and then also to have a very clear idea of where you're going. Um, I think far too often we have, you know, what I call mosquito-like um, interventions, you know, the mosquito kind of dive bombs into the organization and then leaves um, and, and, and nothing happens. Um, so if there's a clear idea of where you're going and what you want to achieve, you can then measure your progress against um, those targets and goals. And, and, and I think a corollary to that point is that we very often don't measure progress. We say, you know, 500 people attended training, but so what? What difference did that actually make in terms of how um, people are experiencing inclusion in that workplace or externally as a result of the work that that particular organization does. But if there's one message, it's leaders have to commit. Leaders have to commit. And I think that that is just a summary of, of what she has said. We need to have the commitment and we have to be intentional about ensuring DEI. Um, over to you, Shovan. I mean, you, you've listened a lot, and um, I know you still have some bit of nuggets to spice it more, and so um, over to you. Yeah, thanks so much, and, and thanks to Florence and, and Wendy. Um, there's a lot in there, and I hope that I can add to that uh, significant list. So uh, from, from in my career, I've worked with organizations whose core function was as a humanitarian NGO, they, they work solely on gender equality and the empowerment and protection of women and girls. And I've also collaborated with organizations whose core mandate is around um, older people, persons with disabilities, LGBTIQA um, uh, persons, um, marginalized groups like the Roma, and all this in an emergency context. And there are incredibly important learning from these organizations. But the most, um, most development and humanitarian organiza organizations don't have a core mandate like, like these. They're more generalists um, than, than these organizations. And, and while I've seen significant progress over the years, there's, there's so much to do to advance DEI in that space. Um, so I was thinking about, and unfortunately, I can't share one shining example of an organization who's got that formula right, a generalist, a generalist organization. And I'm sure it's out there, but I just I just don't know them. Um, but I'd like to share a, a, some, a series of, of good practices that I believe are essential steps and add to, to what uh, Florence and Wendy have already um, said. And that's, I think that organizations um, and actions 
taken by them have to have an intersectional approach to uh, diversity inclusion and to invest the time and money required for this. They also need to have that architecture um, of policies, strategies, action plans, and monitoring, evaluation, uh, um, accountability, and learning frameworks to support their commitment. Um, this, this, this next one is really, really close to my heart. Um, I really think we have to have organizations that flip the narrative and the approach that focuses on vulnerability and need to one that of inclusion and capacity. And I think that whole, it might sound like a small point, but I, I really find it difficult to, to consider this idea of, you know, the most vulnerable, vulnerable people. I know that people are put in very vulnerable situations, but they are not in inherently vulnerable. And I think if we make that switch in our mind to from one of vulnerability and need to one of inclusion and capacity, I think we will reframe the issue significantly. Um, to, to Wendy's point, I think um, organizations that are not personality driven, um, that they don't rely on that one person, that one particular leader or a small number of leaders that have you know DEI um, as as an intention, um, to one where it is fundamental and embedded into the work of the organization, so that the organization embraces DEI as a um, key quality marker and and measure of success of the program. And um, the last one I think for me is around um, uh, analysis and data. Organizations that pri prioritize conducting primary data um, on intersectional and, ge and gender with local researchers um, in development and humanitarian settings is absolutely key, where the emphasis is, and, and this seems like um, it's it should be a natural progression to conduct the analysis and then have the analysis inform your programming. But unfortunately, that is not always the case. Um, organizations, again, stop at the point of having had conducted the um, analysis and in the chain of actions, um, the, it doesn't get translated into um, the, 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 the informing programming. So I think that's absolutely critical. So they would be some of my fundamental steps to be taken for good DND. All right. Thank you very much uh, to you, Florence, uh, to Wendy and Siobhan. Um, I think this is the time for me to hear from my listeners or our listeners and participants. And so I would want us to consider uh, the things that have been said in terms of being aware and having the commitment. So at this point, we would want to hear from you, the listeners. Um, in terms of whether you have received training on DEI in the workplace. So we are going to launch the pool and then um, I would want to hear from you. Yeah, so the pool is up. Um, do your best to select and submit and then we get interactive and I will equally allow uh, my panelists to, um, to get on some of the the results that we will get. All right. I want to believe um, everyone has uh, responded to the pool. Um, so I have. Yes, and as a result, I have made concrete changes to my workplace or relations, which is yes with the impact. Uh, we also have, it was in, yes, it was interesting, but didn't support me to do anything differently or was a one off. Uh, that is the second option. And then we have a third one, no, and I want to do some training and the short form is no want. And then we have the last one that says, um, no, it's not my list of priority. Um, quite interesting. Um, we have no, I want to do some training um, as the one 
uh, that is leading with 52%. And then this is followed by yes with impact. And the third is yes with little or no impact. And surprisingly, we did not get a response for no, uh, not priority at this time. And so just for me to engage the participant, I would be glad to have someone who selected yes. As a result, I made concrete change to my work and our work relations to comment on their response um, as quick as possible. Anyone who selected that particular, um, how do you call it, um, response? I think you can unmute and then respond or share your reason for selecting that. All right, uh, let, let me call on Wendy as we wait for someone to come in. Uh, when, when, Wendy, what, what does this mean to you? Um, what, what is the experience you can share on this? I'm, I have to say I'm actually quite surprised by, by, by these um, results. You know, I have a sense that, that training is very often seen by organizations as the panacea. Yes, we need to do something about DEI, so let's train everyone in unconscious bias or, you know, gender issues or disability inclusion. So um, I was actually surprised that there's a full 52% of participants who have not done training. Um, in, and, and I'm actually very delighted to see that 29%, which is close to a third, are saying they've done training and that, that, that it had impact. Um, so, so yes, I'm, I'm surprised um, and in some ways concerned, but in some ways very encouraged by, by, by these results, because certainly in my experience, a lot of training happens People are sort of shoved into a room or told to do an online course. Um, and, you know, and they leave the training and it's kind of like, well, you know, what now? What do I do with this knowledge? Um, so, so I think there's huge capacity, obviously, or huge potential um, for the design and implementation of training, not as a quick win and not as a panacea, but very carefully thought through so that people leave the training with the tools that they need in order to start making a real difference in the workplace. All right, thank you. Um, let me call on Florence. Uh, Florence, uh, could you share your experience on uh, this pool? Hi, yeah. Uh, to share my experience is that sometimes for the people who receive training and didn't uh, implement any change. It's not supported by the development of milestones and indicators as well as resources. So the commitment of resources in the form of a budget that is inclusive uh, is very critical towards implementation of uh, uh, in equality, sorry, diversity, inclusion and equality. How? Sometimes you, you need to design programs to learn from uh, in order to implement the training or capacity building you acquired. For those who are saying no, they have never received a training and would want to receive one, include of it is uh, a well uh, placed organization to provide trainings on uh, diversity, equality, and inclusion, and will definitely support the planning, programming, and uh, 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 the allocate uh, the supposition of resource allocation in the form of inclusive budgeting to enable you implement uh, DEI. Thank you. All right, thank you. And and I mean we can't keep uh, emphasizing that we are the right people, the right organization uh, to help you understand your issues, but also be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, we, we have a second pool, uh, which is basically also trying to hear from you, my participant, um, in terms of what is the most difficult part of implementing DEI in your organization from your experience. So 
we have only uh, option one is um, lack of training, which means that you've only, you have only one of or minimal training that is available. Option two, compliance as a driver explained as DEI is seen as a compliance issue and the only reason to do it. Um, we have the third option as the impact of DEI in the workforce and not understood. That is DEI impact not understood. And the last option is leadership does not understand or prioritize the issue. That is leadership's lack of buy-in. Um, yeah, I await your responses and then we can share and um, finalize our wonderful discussions and learnings. I still have more people to vote. I have 19 out of 26, still waiting. I think if you have any further uh, information you want to add or questions, you can put in the chat and um, we can equally pick up from there. Yeah, if you have uh, questions that come up for you, as, as we are going along, just drop it in the chat. Okay. Um, yeah, just a request. I still have five more people to vote, and then um, we will share our thoughts on the, the results. All right, so I have 80% people have participated. I want to end the pool and then show the results. And um, this time I want to call Chauvin um, to pick on one of these findings and share your thoughts. Um, yeah, so, sorry. Yeah. sorry. Yeah, there we go. I think the results are up. Thank you. Um, this is really interesting. Um, coming out of the first question about training, um, and I think that reflected the the emphasis that is often put on on training. Um, that then the lack of training doesn't score highly in this poll um, as a, a, a difficult part of implementing DEI. I think that's uh, really interesting. I do think there's a slight anomaly here in um, the people who would turn up to a webinar on DEI um, are probably you know, partially on their own journey and their organizational journey in terms of DEI, so maybe not, not overly surprising. Um, what, I, what I do like about this is that it really does underscore something that I feel is really critical that um, the messaging on the impacts of DEI on development and humanitarian programming are not under understood. I think you know the point that we were we were you know just laid out earlier on was that um, from a corporate point of view, it's 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 easy to think about um, DEI having an impact on the bottom line, on the profit line. And then if you, you know, when you show that, and there's a lot of evidence to show that, then leadership are only too willing to get behind that. But DEI in development outcomes are far less tangible. And also, and, and so because they're so less tangible, then looking at a bot bottom line, it's, it's more difficult to get leadership involved. And just one last point on, on this, because I, I really, you know, for me, DI impacts not being understood is, is really a key issue that we need to do more about as a community of activists and people who are passionate about, about DEI. I do think what also stops DEI impacts being understood is that if they, if they are not understood, then people who work in humanitarian and development 
carry around their own um, maybe prejudices, unconscious biases, um, and misunderstand the people with whom they work with in the communities. And so then there is this very, very real danger of what we call service provider bias in terms of the way that we look at the communities that we serve in development and humanitarian. So I would love this subject to become the, the so a, a subject of um, intense um, scrutiny and um, capacity building and tools to, to advocate and to lobby with leadership and people in power who hold the purse strings can make the, inf the, the changes, the change makers in this regard, that, so that DEI impacts are better understood. Sorry, I've gone on a bit longer than I should there, Emmanuel. All right, thank you. And um, I want to thank our participants and listeners. Um, at this point, I think I would want to have um, the final words of my panelists, and um, I still see we don't have much questions in the chat, and I believe that we've done our best to engage you responding to the polls. So let me go to Florence. Um, in a minute, could you please um, give your, your final reflection and take away from this webinar? Over. Uh, the takeaway... Uh points from the webinar are that diversity, equality, and inclusion is not complex. It is simple. It only requires commitment um, and deliberate actions to ensure that it happens in your organizations where you work, especially development uh, initiatives and a humanitarian action. So commitment and being deliberate is all we desire and having people who have the will to implement diversity, equality and inclusion is very, very vital. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, Wendy, over to you. Yes, I, I, I mean, I agree with Florence that DEI is simple. But in its simplicity, it is actually really difficult. I mean, and that seems to be a contradiction. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's not rocket science, but because we're dealing with human beings and their fears and their anxieties and their biases and their um, preconceived ideas and assumptions, it's often quite hard to, to overcome those. And it requires really courageous um, and tough conversations sometimes. And I think often we're reluctant to have those um, because, because they're difficult. Um, so, so, I mean, and, and that's why I said we need leadership commitments because they are in a position to lead those kinds of courageous conversations. I mean, perhaps just a couple of other points. Um, the whole DEIB endeavor is about acknowledging people as human beings deserving of respect and dignity. At the end of the day, that, that really is what it's about. And that's whether those people are our colleagues in the workplace, the people who we are working with in the communities. And I would hope that humanitarian and development agencies are uniquely positioned to acknowledge that because to me, it seems inherent in the work that they do. Um, but it does require being deliberate. It requires persistence. And it requires resilience because it's not easy. It's not a quick fix. It doesn't happen overnight. Um, and, and, and it's a journey which I think we are constantly going to be traveling. All right. Thank you. And um, I can see from the chats that um, some of our panelists are quite excited, uh, but also having the opportunity to drink from the wisdom that you have. Um, Valentina has mentioned, Valentine has mentioned, thank you to the host and panelists. Uh, this is super insightful conversation. And I want to tell you that we are the best who can give you um, such insight. Um, Peace is mentioning that this is very good discussion here in, would be great to tackle DEI using comic aids so it is easy to understand for grassroots change and she's expressing her appreciation. Um, there is a question from Caesar who says, we are applying alternative text 
and making our reports tables, diagrams accessible and um, reader friendly for screen readers. Is this an example of DEI being applied to our daily activities? Um, I want Florence to take that over to you, Florence, and you can add your final uh, parting words. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, is a, this is part of the application of diversity, equality and inclusion, because one of the principles is comprehensive accessibility. And by you providing a, a pictorial formats that are accessible to screen readers and tables is a good gesture. I would like to thank everyone who has given us the opportunity to, to talk about diversity, equality and inclusion and for providing your time to listen to us. We pray that this continues. Thank you. All right, there is no better way to end this, but I still feel um, so fun. Just, just summarize everything and then um, um, we'll say the final words and uh, end this webinar. Over to you in just 30 seconds. Ooh, no pressure. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> loved, I loved the way that Florence and, and Wendy rolled that up at the very end. Um, Florence, you know, laying it out that this is simple. And, 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 and that in itself seems that I'm, I'm accepting the contradiction that I made earlier on when I talked about its complexity, but Wendy so eloquently dealt with that. I think it is, it's a simple request to have dignity, humanity, have kindness and understanding about um, our, our, our um, the people that we work with in development and, and um, humanitarian action. I think it's simple from our point of view because we have the passion for this topic. We, we see how, how easy it could be applied. But where I think it gets complex is that we are dealing with um, very human emotions. We're dealing with complex so uh, social constructs of, of who is in and who is outside of the tent. And so I would agree um, totally with Wendy at the end. I think we deal with these matters with wisdom, with, um, with respect. Um, and I would also add this um, with kindness. There's a lot of very frank conversations to do to have with people um, in, especially those who are the decision makers, the change makers. And so if we can do so with openness, with frankness, with kindness and respect, I think we'll go a long way. Thank you. All right, thank you. And uh, to the different diverse participants or listeners that we have, I'll do my best to try and thank you all in most of the, the key languages that I know, I would want to say thank you, uh, merci beaucoup, asante sana, and um, thank you again. Um, so just to wrap it up, today has been very wonderful having my three seasoned panelists. And it's just something you need to know that Includovate is running a series of webinar um, on DEI. And we will be announcing on our websites and different social media channels where you found this one. And so be on the lookout. Um, specifically, we'll be looking at DEI in the corporate and development or humanitarian sector, uh, looking deeper into um, specific forms of diversity inclusion, such as disability inclusion, gender equality, uh, the empowerment of women and girls, as well as inclusion of LGBTQ uh, groups. Um, we will be exploring some of the key issues that uh, the panelists have mentioned that we need to have an intersectional lens uh, when we are looking at uh, DEI. So at this stage, we would love to hear from you, um, your ideas of topics that you think we should consider um, in our webinar. So you can type them in the chat. Um, and finally, and finally, I mean, you've heard insightful nuggets. These are things that are shared from the point of experience based on what our experts have shared. And so we are introducing to you Eglodovit Pro is a new and unique subscription model that, that we offer. And it allows individuals and organizations to assess a range of affordable DEI services, such as coaching, capacity building, and technical advice. 
um, the program links you and the organization to an expert DEI coaches, just like what you have here as my panelists. And they create a range of interventions that is tailored to your distinct needs. Our training sessions, learning events, and group meetings also does provide opportunities to learn and reflect with people who are curious and committed to DEI um, as you are, because you've participated in this uh, webinar. So at include of it, we believe that DEI support should be widely accessible and affordable. And for that reason, we offer these different ranges of options um, that I've mentioned, which you can choose um, the one that best meets your budget and requirement. And so just want to reiterate that um, you can get more about uh, our pro and then get in touch with us. Do your best to follow our website, social media handles, and don't forget to share the message. Um, we are going to make this available also on our YouTube channel. And so you could fall back, get some uh, rewatching and share as well. So once again, thank you very much. And uh, we hope to see you in our next subsequent uh, webinars. Thank you. Bye-bye.